this talk is, is about a 40-minute talk. Uh, for those of you who know my style, it's about 350 slides or something like that. The notion that we're getting after here is we're looking at about 50 years of pollution regulation. And what we're investigating is that software security really isn't that new. It is, because software is new. But really, software insecurity is a human problem, just like pollution or auto safety or safety in our pharmaceuticals. This is the same problem repeated again and again throughout history. So it's nothing new, really. But what we need is a framework in which to approach it. So we'll look at about 50 years of regulatory history in about 20 minutes or less. I won't punish you that much. And that bit, I've read a lot of stuff, so. <laughs> and then we're gonna look at probably about 10 lessons that we can pull out of the regulatory environment to understand maybe what we're doing right in software security and most likely what we're doing wrong. So the story of pollution starts back, if I got this right, starts back in the 1960s. And the 1960s was a real watershed decade for the United States because what you saw at the United States is we had reached a breaking point with pollution. Okay? What we saw was pretty devastating across the nation. The Cuyahoga River Okay, was literally all sludge. That is the river. It's not the Gulf Coast after a BP spill. Okay, that is the river. And Time Magazine described it thus. They said it was chocolate brown, oily, bubbling subsurface gases. It oozed rather than flowed. The article goes on to say that it had no visible life, not even low forms such as leeches and sludge worms that usually thrive on wastes. Lake, uh, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> for the 18th time in 70 years, the river had caught fire. The river had caught fire, okay? Which was a national shame, really, when you saw just how bad it was getting in the U.S. Lake Erie was declared dead, okay? Because all of the algae blooms that were caused by phosphate fertilizers, here you see no phosphates on the left, phosphates on the right, this is wonderful, rich agriculture. The problem was that it was destroying the ecosystem around the farming regions. It was also caused by livestock runoff. Okay? You can imagine that type of sludge getting into your lakes. <laughs> so it ended up killing millions and millions of fish. And fly fishers and fishermen would no longer go to Lake Erie. And it literally was, in 1963, declared dead as one of the largest freshwater lakes in the world. Now, a decades-long campaign of DDT, I kid you not, this was the slogan, DDT is good for me. So we sprayed this stuff all over the place. We sprayed it at the beaches to get rid of mosquitoes. We used it as disinfectant for workers and at summer camps. We used this stuff all over the place. We used it just for any reason whatsoever. And this widespread usage magnified it in the food chain. And what we saw was decimation of robins, uh, bald eagles, as well as the brown pelican. Worst of all, though, it increased the likelihood of genotoxicity within humans. Redefinition, cancer, birth defects. So not only was there a lot of pollution in the environment, not only was it killing stuff, but it was killing us in the process. Now, this is the city of Los Angeles in the 1940s. They had spent decades trying to fight smog. And of course, Angelinos would wear gas masks on their commute, or even at social functions. Now, in 1963, I believe, in November, it's, uh, the, uh, what was reported here is that a literally zero, zero visibility cloud extended 20 miles inland, leading to looting, deaths, and 1,500 car accidents. Now, you probably got here without dying in an accident. That's good, right? So this is the very region we're talking about that was so plagued by smog for literally decades, so bad that in the early 1940s that uh, we thought that the Japanese were doing a gas attack against Los Angeles. That's how bad the smog was. But it was us, not the Japanese, do doing it. So it earned Los Angeles the title Smog Town. But Los Angeles wasn't the only city that was experiencing this environmental devastation. New York City also had incredibly bad smog. In 1963, these are actual photos, there were 200 deaths or smog-related deaths. And in 1966, there was 170 deaths. If you look really closely, this is a smog day shot at one o'clock in the afternoon. You can see barely 
the Empire State Building right there and the Chrysler Building. All right. So what happened was, is a lot of doctors started coming out, like Dr. Poitinger and Dr. Quinn, and they came out in the New York Times and basically said that cancer specialists agreed almost unanimously that smog can cause human malignancies. That for healthy lungs, smog was devastating. These are the lungs of a non-smoker that lived in Los Angeles. Now, that was just the smog emissions. On top of all the other emissions that we had, what we noticed was that this, we had this cycle going on, that when you had manufacturers releasing sulfur dioxides, nitrous dioxides, ammonia, and all of these particulates into the atmosphere, you got depositional effects, and of course, then you got the result of acid rain. So we saw defoliation of our forests. We saw millions and millions of ki uh, fish killed and lakes devastated. And of course, acid rain is such that it even erodes stone over a period of time. So this breaking point was really achieved over a hundred and well, over more than a hundred years. It extended all the way back to the 1800s, where industrialization and all of the smoke coming out of these stacks as a result was not seen as pollution. It was seen as prosperity, which led to kind of a perverse pride where you have the city of Pittsburgh here at 11 a.m. in the morning where people had to bring three shirts to work because if you put your shirt on, the coal dust was so great that your shirt would be dirty by 9 a.m. They said this, the smoke was good for you. It killed malaria. Or my favorite, it saved the eyesight because the near constant darkness ensured no glare. <laughs> It gets even worse. Pollution, in the book The Foundry, pollution was a source of pride and symbol of prosperity. Could you practically taste air thick with iron filings and acids? Did the blast furnaces light up the night sky and blot out the stars? Did the waters run thick and red with waste and cause the fish to sicken and die? Excellent! Those were the infallible signs of competitive success. That is the perverse pride we had in our pollution. So when we saw pollution back then, it wasn't the stench that we smelled. It was really the smell of money. It was prosperity incarnate, that if your city was covered with smog, you were industrial powerhouse. And that's what mattered in the process of industrialization, because if you polluted, you prospered. And that was the paradigm we operated under. This really is what I'm describing as the first age of pollution control, which was there wasn't any. This was the age of denial. The age of denial was that pollution was inevitable. You had to pollute if you wanted to prosper. Okay? You had to pollute if you wanted to prosper. Thanks for the giggles who picked up on that this is a scene from the Matrix. All right. So, <laughs> The 1960s, though, was a watershed event because what happened was is that you saw a national endeavor to vote against pollution. That if any of you remind, uh, re uh, remember the crying Indian, this was the attempt on part of the US government to communicate to people that pollution was not prosperity. In 1960, we saw the first Clean Water Act. In 1964, we saw the first Wilderness Preservation Act. In 1965, we saw the Water Quality Act, which surprised me because this was really the precursor to the Safe Drinking Water Act that wasn't passed until three years after I was born, which to this day still shocks me. Noise Control Act, Solid Waste Disposal Act. In 1967, you saw the Air Quality and Clean Air Act. 1968, Wild and Scenic Rivers Act, National Trail System Act. And in 1969, automakers actually settled a suit with the Department of Justice for conspiracy to stifle pollution control devices. And then finally, 1969, we have the formulation of our national environmental policy, which led to the Environmental Protection Agency. So what this did was usher in a whole new era, though, of command and control regulation. And the command and control regulation was the government telling private industry to clean up their act. <laughs> All right, this was a polluter pays model. A polluter pays model where <coughs> the polluter, through a series of Pigovian taxes, pays for the offset. That is, they didn't have to pay for clean air, and so they used too much of it. And so we tax their usage through all sorts of other forms, but it was a polluter pays model. 
Basically, we raise the social cost, raise the private cost of those companies to offset the social cost to everybody else. What in economic terms we call internalizing the externality. Okay, in this case, the negative externality of smog, killed rivers, dead river, dead lakes, and millions of fish and birds dying. So this. <laughs> This entered in the second age of pollution, which was really end of pipe regulations. And end of pipe regulations were really about making the polluters pay at the end of the pipe. We're simply paying for the emission when it goes out into the environment. And this seemed like a good thing, because when we look at the numbers across decade, or across the decade scale, we see that we have the lowest incidence of wet sulfates, nitrous oxides, sulfur dioxides than ever before. When we look at the amount of ozone in the atmosphere, that is ozone-causing days, i.e. smog, it's the lowest it's ever been, that despite rising global temperatures, at least we've got clean air, right? So <laughs> when we look at our wet sulfates out in the environment, basically this is an indicator of acid rain, when we compare it to the 1980s compared to the mid-2000s, you see a tremendous decrease in the amount of wet sulfates. Basically, that's good for everybody. You get more trees and less dead fish and animals. Now, <laughs> the headache that was caused by all this was that command and control regulations prescribed specific treatment technologies without any notion of efficiency or cost effectiveness. So what happened was is that businesses perceived all of this to be a drag on the business. It was a drag on performance to have all these regulations. Of course, then private industry became reactive as a result and they chose to fight legal battles instead of actually confronting it. And the legal battles were really uh, comprised of focusing on compliance. That is, meeting the minimum requirements to dodge any fines that might be levied against them. Now, all this game playing doomed companies to even more onerous regulations, which really treated the symptoms and did nothing to deal with the source of the problem. So, <laughs> it also created a perversity which meant that business leaders tended to look at any gain in social issues was a loss for the business. That if in my personal life I might be philanthropic and donate to charities, you better believe my business isn't going to fail for social issues. That is, businesses chose more of themselves rather than social issues. And this was true to a degree because pollution control devices do nothing to increase efficiency or increase revenues. They only add cost period, end of story, and businesses are highly allergic to government mandated costs. And they will do anything they can to avoid it. Now, something changed in the mid-1980s, okay? Exhausted with dancing around the mountain of regulations, companies like 3M and DuPont actually saw pollution as bad for business. They saw it as a social issue now, and they said our brand is being affected by how we treat the environment. So they also saw that dialogue with stakeholders was preferable over legal actions. That if we actually reached out and started talking to people to get input, this was far more beneficial than trying to engage NGOs or the federal government in legal actions. All right, so this entered in to the third age of pollution control. And the third age of pollution control was really the greening of American business. It introduced terms like eco-efficiency and product stewardship. It was this notion that we actually cared about our effects as a company on everybody else that we touched, not just from a consumer perspective, but from a citizen and human perspective. So private industry at that point was really on the threshold of opportunity because they realized the dichotomy between social improvement and business loss was false. That the dichotomy was false. That we didn't have to give up social issues in favor of business issues or we didn't have to use profit and forego our social impact. And that was a considerable change. They realized that they could reduce costs, they could reduce risk, they could reduce resistance from stakeholders as well as improving the planet. So the greening of American business was a good thing for all of us. 
But it got even better. Because in the early 2000s, you saw a revolution occur. You saw companies like GE and their Echo Imagination campaign. And what they did was pursue different kinds of technologies that not only just did not emit lower emissions, but didn't produce emissions in the first place. So whether it was jet engines or locomotives or even the light bulbs that we use now, it was, a, it was really an introduction that not only can we make the world a better place, but we can make a crap 